Well, hello and welcome to this beautiful episode of The First Mover. I'm Nathaniel Getzels and this is Sarah Anderson. Hello. And we are here with our wonderful guest, Kamiar. Thank yes. you for having me. You know, tell us uh, a little about, but about what you do. Sure. So I'm in the, um, I'm a commercial real estate broker. Mm -hmm. So I represent uh, mainly buyers and, but my main bread and butter is commercial lending for um, currently for a lot of owner user buildings on the mm -hmm. either SBA side or conventional. Um, so, you know, I, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I graduated UCLA mm -hmm. 2002. Um, you know, so we're in the origin story. Good. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So meanwhile, while I was in UCLA, it was a uh, private tutoring, mm -hmm. a lot of kids. Um, uh, going along, you know, later, um, about 2003, my father was uh, refinancing one of his um, properties and the gentleman that came to the house to do the loan docs, um, really, I felt they didn't do a good job. I mm -hmm. felt like the way he was, uh, you know, speaking, reviewing everything, I felt I could do a lot better than that. Was so, that the notary or the lender? That was the actual loan docs. With, okay. the not with the actually loan officer came with a notary. Okay. Got it. So okay. Both of them came, which just trying to get a good it. picture who's sitting where, right. who's drinking the coffee, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. And so at that point, I really mm -hmm. decided, you know, I think that's a really good field for me to join. Mm -hmm. And I went and got my uh, license first, my um, agent license. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in March of 2004. Then I decided, wait, I have a bachelor's. I can get my broker's degree. So later, about nine months later, I got my broker's license you know, December of 2004. Um, at that point, I started working for a company mm -hmm. uh, for about one year to just get experience. And I thought, you know what? It's time to open my own office. People are saying, are you sure you know everything? I'm like, you know what? We're going to make some mistakes, but we're going to learn and we're going to open our own office and give the best customer service possible. So you were working as a lender at that point or an agent? A loan officer. Loan officer. Okay. Yeah. At that time, they didn't require the NMLS numbers. Right. Okay. So, so it was uh, mainly I was doing on the lending side on the residential. Mm -hmm. 2005, you know, I started my own company. I had a partner at the time, Wembley's, which is currently still exists that we're right. using. So, um, so you were partnered with Wembley's? No, I was partner. I had a partner in Wembley's. We, oh, oh. we both started at 50 50. Got it. Okay. And what, um, what is the name of your current company? Wembley's. Wembley's. Okay. Same company. Okay, I same bought company. them out after okay, the okay, 2008 okay. turmoil. So you are the owner operator of Wembley at this point, yes. which is based in Calabasas, Correct. California. Correct. Got it. Okay. So you started that with a partner. Correct. At that point. Right. When you decided to go on your own. Okay. Right. And, and then, then uh, you know, we started doing, you know, um, did a little bit of marketing. And mm -hmm. uh, at the time, as you know, it was a very hot market. Uh, we were doing probably around 50 to 70 loans a month mm -hmm. um, going. And then it came, everything was great. Came down to around 2008, where in the bank's bellied up, there was no money to be lent. And right. then at that time, it was, you know, I can easily see a 60, 70, 75% of the competition went out of business. Mm -hmm. Too much overhead, no business money coming in. for you, right? Right. Yeah. How, how did you navigate that, though? How did you not get in that position? So what we did is, number one, I didn't have too much overhead. Okay. So we were, uh, at that point, we were at a month to month on the office. So we okay. gave the mm -hmm. office back. We went and got office in Santa Monica for a thousand square feet. Okay. It was also month to month. Uh, my partner decided, said, I don't want to stay in this business anymore. He's like, just, you know. Right. So I'm he out. was bewildered. You're like, I'm all in. He's, I'm all out. Correct. Got exactly. It. So at that point, the only way <clears throat> to survive that market was, uh, you know, as many folks were doing low modifications. Right. Absolutely. But it also, that turned out after the six months to have a kind of a bad connotation. People okay. were taking people's money, not really doing the work. Mm -hmm. So if you were actually doing good deeds for people making them get the low mods people trusted you and they referred you to the clients okay so i started doing a lot of low mods in the upper echelon clients beverly hills brentwood people owe three four five million they couldn't pay they had not paid some three months some six months some okay. one year so i was able to get you know take care of the loans to a point where they didn't have to make any back payments those were all pushed to the back of the loan as a balloon payment but and then mm -hmm. got them 2%, 3% rates. That's impressive. That's great. You know, yeah. Some for five years, some for 10 years, some yeah. even a 40 year fixed. Mm -hmm. That's very impressive. Right. Yeah. That's great. So, because of that, I was able to, you know, number one, get a lot more referrals. Mm -hmm. There were still banks like HSBC who were doing stated loans for, the, for some clients. Mm -hmm. You had to have, give them a $100,000 deposit, but they were doing, you know, the pure stated. Mm hmm. Um, until about 2011, 12. Don't quote me on the date, please. 
Uh, but again, other banks, you know, the retail banks, you know, the B of A's, the Wells, were still giving out loans, but obviously they're very cautious. Right. But during this time of about two to three years of doing loan modifications, uh, dealing with an upper echelon, I was able to obtain their trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and a lot of them had a lot of commercial properties. Mm -hmm. So, so at that point, were you doing commercial loans or just regular that's when loan I try, loans? When I, that's when I transitioned to the commercial loans. Okay. For because residential? of the clients that are for existing clients. Okay. Okay. I still do residential loans because of, of, you know, being in the industry for 20 years, but my, my main focus is uh, commercial okay. lending. Okay. okay. Either it being SBA, investment, CMPS, depending on the client's needs okay. and the financials. Okay. So you started because uh, you thought you could do it better right correct and then the crash happened and you were able to make it through the crash because you had low overhead and you weren't overspending right. and you were able to make it through you kind of absorbed your your partner at right. that point and became right. all yours right and then through just you know really servicing your clients you thrived through that and then you found that all of these people needed commercial correct. uh loans and right. so you went well there's a new need so basically it sounds like you're finding needs and and where things are lacking and you fill in that void and right. provide uh, excellent service for right. for your people, the number right? one objective for any client today for anybody who wants to get in in the industry who stay who is in the industry is customer service right holding you know your client's hand from a to z and always being there for them. so important you know so important and that's going to make you different from everybody else absolutely it's easier said than done for a, a lot of people absolutely so you feel like that's your main di differentiator Correct. you just uh make sure you fill the gap and you over service service right. service service it's all about service absolutely right and obviously we have a lot of competition out there there's a lot of other people yeah. so you have, somehow have to differentiate yourself right and so i mean what is the differentiator about the service you provide obviously um you know you care that's clear right and you're you're good at finding the gaps right so what is the the differentiator and the, it's the the way about, you provide the service it's about explaining this you know the process from a to z and explaining you know when the client calls you um if particular questions you explain it to them thoroughly so they understand mm -hmm. they don't have this lingering idea i don't know what's happening but i'm just going through with the process they trust you you build it's their a, trust. The trust correct exactly and yes. majority of my clients i could say 95 percent are all based on referrals yes i could That's understand great. that yeah you know it's um it's very hard it takes many years to get to this point yes and uh you just have to keep giving the best service holding your client's hands and explain it. You know, I, I always get introduced to clients that are not necessarily um, want to buy today or they want to get a loan today, but I explain everything to them. This is what you need. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking to buy in about two years, you know, maybe I can look at your tax return before I file it and tell you if this is, these are your currently expenses, what you're trying to obtain in a loan amount, this is what needs to be, you know, prepared. And this is how you're going to get, you know, <clears throat> Approved, you know, certain banks have a 43 uh, debt to income ratio. Certain banks have 45 debt to income ratio. Right. And just make sure not to obtain too much debt. So through learning your clients needs, you can create an authentic organic connection, a tune with them and then build that relationship until they're ready to uh, transact. Correct. Terrific. Exactly. What did you do before you were um, before you had the experience with your your dad's loan? I was a private tutor from the age of 16. That's right. At UCLA, ah. right? Right. No, prior to starting right. in high school. Okay. So I, I, you know, I tutored in chemistry, physics, and math. There you go. That, so. so that's where the, the background of educating and holding learning hands. and attuning and holding hands Correct. comes from. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, today we are, you know, we're in a very unique, stagnant market. Yes. You know, again, it's um, obviously not bad as 2008. The banks have a lot of money. Right certain p amount of people have a lot of money and you have the middle class who got a lot of these um <clears throat> you know money during the COVID times who basically weren't able to spend and now they're using that money and um certain neighborhoods are still going over asking mm -hmm, right certain neighborhoods are not you see more days on the market but it's a very unique market again there absolutely there's not enough there's not a lot of loans being made like before so again a lot of the competition is doing other industries mm -hmm. they can't survive and right. I, um, it's interesting where we're going to head. Yeah. So I want to touch on that in a minute. And before we get to where we're heading, because I, I want to know what, what your perspective is of that. Um, I want to know what your biggest challenge in your business has been since you, you know, since you started it. You obviously, it's now yours, right? right? You run it, uh, 
you're you you run it on your own right Correct. and obviously you have a team right. so what's what's been the biggest challenge that you've had running your your company bringing on um you know agents and loan officers with the same mentality because mm -hmm. i consider wembley's a boutique concierge service brokerage right so when i when i bring on a, others i wanted to have the same mentality and give the same service and the, that's been my biggest challenge is to bring on people with a similar mindset mm -hmm. people that you can trust with your clients trust that will with, them well, like not you only my client even if they're going to bring their own client because it's coming under the umbrella wembley's i want yes. them to have the same you know feel yes you know some people uh, unfortunately that come into the real estate industry come in for a temporary time to make yes. a little bit of quick money and leave correct do you do you find your clients or people that you're speaking with will use you even if they find better rates elsewhere just based on your level of service? It's 50-50. 50-50, okay. You know, a, a, many, many clients in the higher echelon are very rate conscious. Yes. Even an eighth or a quarter will make them change. Okay. To a different person. Okay. You know, so it, it depends. But I'm okay with it because I've seen clients go, let's say uh, one of the bigger retail banks will give them a better rate. Mm -hmm. But on the following deal, they'll come back to me and I can get them a better rate. They don't, and they don't get the service at a big retail Correct. bank that yeah. they would get with you. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, you know, you were reading a really, um, we were discussing a really interesting article going back to where we think things are headed. Mm -hmm. Um you want to you want to mention some of the points of that that article? Yeah, we I was we was reading an article today about yeah. how higher end commercial property seems to be holding up the commercial market right now. B and C right. buildings seem to be the ones suffering. Correct. Um, would you say that the higher level commercial pertains to retail that's holding it up more? Office space, high end. What do you, multifamily, mm. high end? What would you th say in the LA area? My guess would be the. Um... The shopping centers. The shopping centers. And the industrial buildings. You know, okay. uh, multifamily, it honestly depends on location and the rents and how much they're increasing rents. They've been hit pretty hard. And when they're coming to, you know, uh, because of their vacancy factors coming to refinance, they have to, a lot of them have to put money out of pocket mm -hmm. to obtain a new loan. How much higher are the vacancy rates right now compared to, I don't know, 10, 5, 10 years ago? Every city... Is different every city based on the street is different you okay. know mm -hmm. it's very hard to give you an like an average of all okay it's a, it's very dependent on the city okay like los angeles for example how are they doing vacancy wise would you say generally speaking i really don't know the statistic but i would say probably they'll call me 12 to 15 12 to 15 percent rough for where i mean again you know like downtown is a higher much higher vacancy. Yes. You know, we have a lot you know, of vacancy. That's something that's interesting. What do you think of downtown? Because, you know, downtown LA is very unique because uh, obviously the the uh, office space is becoming a ghost town down there. Correct. But the higher end rentals are just, I mean, they're on fire. They have a, a very low vacancy rate and you see a lot of new um, high end, I mean, I'm talking about residential rentals, right. by the way, just to be you know, because I know we were switching gears from we're going between commercial right. and, and so. But what what do you think is going to end up happening? Because there's all these vacant home, uh, not homes, uh, office space, but the residential rentals down there are very busy, and you know they're building more. I think they're in the process of building the uh, a new um, high rise there that might be the the biggest in downtown possibly i'm not sure Don't right that, but... they're saying the biggest on the west coast or something i've, I've right. heard and of it's, that it's all rentals it's all uh, right. high-end uh or apartments right so what do you think is going to happen like do you think it's going to be more uh like a peer space kind of situation where it's co-working space or is it going to be converted to i mean where do you see all that what do you see happening all that space down there i think a lot, the more successful spaces based on my experience are you know, are going to be the ones that are the co-working live work play mm -hmm. you're seeing that concept more in terms of uh the residential rental you know more towards the art district is are the ones that you're seeing that are getting more rented out easier right in this like the mid of downtown there, there's a lot of vacancies you know yeah and it's all because of a lot of you know what's happened after the covid years of the homelessness mm -hmm. and the <clears throat> of the crime scene so you're getting a lot of people that are moving out Right. You know, before COVID, I think that they, they, they didn't fear for the life as now as they do. And you see it on the news, a lot of the yeah. stuff you see it that's happening. Yeah. In terms of the office space, it's very hard to say what's going to happen. There was one or two buildings that just got sold 
fifty percent off their market price as of from ten years ago. One was the Aeon building. Right. That's crazy. You know? Yeah. So it's it's a very hard guess. Mm -hmm. You know, in that sector, what's going to happen? I mean, overall, you know, the office space is down. Right. On the bigger buildings, the high rises. Yeah. So, and obviously, you know, it's volatile. There was a lot of fallout from uh, people not having to go to work during COVID. And then, right. you know, there's there's kind of two mindsets, it seems, that are taking over. You have the mindset of the companies that are saying, come back to the office. You need to come back to the office. And if you don't will replace you with someone who will come back to the office. And then the companies that are kind of giving up and going, well, you can work from home forever and we'll just close our office or shrink our office right. or, you know, what do you think is going to win out there? I think a lot of companies are going to going to go back to the office. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, because of the teamwork, the team meetings, you know, that feel you have when you're in office, you work, you know, you talk to others versus, you know, when you're in a home, great, you can work, I'm not saying it, depending on the what industry you're in, but you don't have that office feeling. Collaboration. You know? Yeah. Collaboration is yes. one, you know, like you can just get up, you know, go eat something, mm -hmm. just go for a walk. But when you're in office, you're, you know, you're limited. Right. And I mean, I obviously, you know, through the years we've seen office spaces change. We saw like, let's use um, uh, law offices as an example. 20 years ago, you had a law office, you needed a library in that law office just for the books. Right. Then all of a sudden everything went, went electronic. Great. Now you need smaller and smaller spaces. And obviously we saw at that time, the price per square foot of those kinds of offices was actually increasing right. because you needed less space. And so they were nicer spaces and they became more valuable because they could pack more people in. Obviously, we're not going to see that now right. um, with the new office spaces. But, you know, I was in a um, actually speaking of since we're all really based in Calabasas, I'll use Calabasas as an example. Right. I was in a new space. We've seen a lot, an explosion of co-working spaces in Calabasas. Right. And I was in a new one. Um, I think last week we were at a ribbon cutting. And it was really interesting because it's a beautiful space and it's like garages in this you know, pretty modern kind of space, but the companies that are based there, it's an escrow company, a real estate company, uh, production companies, mm -hmm. um, uh, a company that sells like items online and, and right. gifts, e a gifting company, yeah. uh, e-commerce companies, <clears throat> you know, but it looked beautiful, but these are companies that, you know, five years ago would have an entire private office space. Now they have Four or five hundred square feet in a co-working space with a shared, uh, a shared conference reception room and, and a shared reception space and a shared kitchen. So, right. I mean, you know, where do you think that that we're headed in that space? You know, you will see more of those, but right now, like especially right now, even with the rates higher, you you we're, we're um, a lot of sales are based on owner off owner user buildings that when they're getting the SBA loans with the ten percent down, they're buying their own space. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to get uh, you know use their depreciation and then pay it off over the twenty five years versus always paying rent. Right. You know, so you're seeing more of that, but you know, many. I I do have a lot of clients that are now in the co working space with the five hundred thousand square feet and a lot of their distribution centers they're renting per you know um truck that comes in that's interesting right so we are the the whole formation and how you can do business and how you can use other people's storage and the logistics have changed as you said before everybody had to do it themselves for themselves now with what's happened you know in the um economy you can use other people's spaces to do what you want and you pay them a very small percentage but it allows you to grow without having the overhead. Mm -hmm. and what's right, which is what saved you, low Correct. overhead, right? And that's what scares a lot of people. People are scared of overhead. Yeah. They don't want that $25,000, $30,000, you know, um, office lease, plus, um, you know, renting another um, industrial building for all their, you know, mm -hmm. e-commerce business. So all of a sudden, you know, you have a fifty, sixty, seven thousand dollars $67,000 overhead a month. You got, you know, yeah. how much sales does that take? Versus if you get the co-working space, even if it's three to 5,000. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, you work with somebody using their industrial space, whatever that number com comes out to, that's going to be based on your sales. So you're going to use that based on your sales. So your overhead's going to be, you know, it's not going to be a fixed overhead at that point. It's going to be a variable overhead. We've Absolutely. even cut our office space. 
by yeah. how much? Our office space is uh, 30%. They're, they're yeah. cutting it 30% yeah. smaller right. because there's no need for that much physical space. Right. Yeah. right. People work from, I mean, in real estate, people work from home right. for years, but now more than ever, obviously. Well, no more than, and honestly, for in our industry, you have to be out and about and networking to get your clients. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you're, yeah. you've been in the industry 30, 40 years and you have your set clients and you're looking for any new business. Right. Which means your business is shrinking. Shrink, but you don't mind. You're kind of going to into that retirement yeah, absolutely. stage. You know, yeah. so it all depends where you are. But I mean, in any industry where like cars, which is in the service industry, mm-hmm. we have to be out and about networking. Yeah, absolutely. So I know you do, uh, you focus a lot on lending. You do sales as well, but you also focus Correct. on lending. So using both your sales and your lending mind together um, in this high interest environment, if somebody does want to own, uh, how do they win? Like what, how do they, you know, succeed and build wealth, income, cash on cash, cash flow, right. wealth, whatever it is, uh, equity right. um, in this environment? What, what would your tips be? Well, well th- the way they succeed, number one, there's a couple of different factors. They can buy their building with 10% down, mm-hmm. right? So it's minimal equity. Uh, number two, they get uh, depreciation expense Mm -hmm. and they can also use something called cost segregation to accelerate the depreciation in the early years absolutely which will help them pay less taxes right um just for anybody that doesn't know can you quickly explain that because i've run into a lot of people that don't know what cost segregation is basically cost segregation like a thirty thousand foot view right i'm not a specialist at it but it's just basically you're accelerating your depreciation in the early years of buying the building Mm -hmm. so for example, if, if they depreciate over twenty over twenty seven and a half years or thirty five years, you might be able to depreciate again. They'll call me eighty percent of the first two or three years, mm-hmm. which are th- at that point allows you to you know pay a lot less taxes during the beginning years and negate the higher interest rates that you have Correct. right now. And negate yeah. the higher interest rate right. as well. You okay. you know and as well you know when you get an SBA loan on these buildings, you have to occupy fifty one percent or more. Right. So if you have the extra space, you are allowed to rent it out up to 49% of it. Mm -hmm. So that will also help pay for your mortgage and pay down your mortgage. So, okay, so we have cost segregation. Correct. The SBA, rent the space. What were the other things? And you're gonna pay off the building in 25 years if you don't change the loan. Right. Now, if uh, you wanna do a lower interest loan, you do the first, maybe in the first three years, you can refinance, right? Well, it depends if you get a SBA 504 loan, which is a two-segment loan, which is a conventional 50% first mm-hmm. and a 40% second. Uh, the first, depending, every bank has their own prepayment penalties, but the second, the SBA portion on the 504 always has a 10-year prepay. It's a 10-year oh, okay. declining. But they will allow you to get a new first and they will subordinate themselves. Got it. Interesting. Ver- versus a 7A, the whole loan amount is an SBA loan. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they usually have a three-year prepay, two-year prepay. Again, it all depends on the bank. And if the, you know, if the rates do come down and you're either in your last year of your prepay or the prepay has been gone, that absolutely you can refinance. But also at that time, it will also depend on your tax returns. Have they increased, decreased? Do you qualify for the new loan or not? Right. So you're saying best way to win in the, our current environment, <clears throat> SBA loan, occupy 41, uh, 51%. Oh. Rent forty nine percent, and then uh, pay it off in twenty five years. Correct. Okay. When people are purchasing commercial property now, are they afraid of vacancies? Are they afraid they're not going to be able to fill it? People are going to leave. So the way the bank qualifies you on the five four seven eight, they make sure make sure you can qualify for all hundred percent. They do not include any of the rental income. Okay. So you're getting prepared to be able to survive on without, all hundred percent without anything. Okay. Correct. Okay. You know, on the in terms of will they come and rent for me, it depends on the type of building that you're getting yourself okay. into. You know, I had a client that just bought a building. It was about 12 units. Uh, one of the units, obviously, he took about 55% of it, and okay. he made, he's using it for himself. The other 45%, within almost a year, he was able to rent it out. Okay. Sorry. Did you say that again? Got it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all, again, it all depends on location and everything. But right now, you're all, you know, and on the owner users, the people who are buying it, it's a lot of the smaller office buildings mm-hmm. and or the industrial condo space. Industrial condo space. So meaning you can buy, meaning you you would say get 
an SBA loan and buy an industrial condo if in it a fits bigger the, building. Your, your, you know, business's needs. Mm-hmm. No. So an industrial condo, wouldn't that be harder to rent out half of? Or no, those 49%? are typically 100% they're using it for themselves. Got it. Oh, interesting. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then how would you mitigate your cost on that? Basically, I mean, right now, the price per square feet relative is a lot cheaper if you go if you're trying to buy an a office building even though smaller on a prime area so buy a smaller building in a prime area and you're going to get the best deal there D- depending on location correct yeah. and how do you define smaller building two thousand square feet okay. three thousand okay. square feet okay and what, what prime areas would you recommend right now it all depends LA. where they currently are and where they want to stay okay. there's a lot of different prime areas you know a lot of people are staying in ventura counties a lot okay. of people are in la you know will you know Wilshire in the LA is the prime area. Ventura Boulevard in the Valley is the prime area. Mm-hmm. It all depends where they want to stay. And, and some people say, we don't care to be really on Ventura. We'll go two streets down, but we'll get a better price. But you're still close to the primary area. You're still close yes. to the primary okay. area. Okay. And you know, relative, I, uh, what I, I'm seeing a lot right now is people want to be close to the freeways. Interesting. Right. So your mm-hmm. tip for right now, you think the best values are prime areas close to the freeways, Correct. smaller buildings. Correct. And why is a smaller building a better value? It's more affordable. If at any point, you know, you're kind of, you know, you don't need the building or you want to rent it out or sell it, it's always easier to sell sell a smaller building versus a bigger building. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot more, more people are able to afford it. Absolutely. So if you were going to look at the entire, let's just say Southern California, and you said, okay, from a strictly financial standpoint, this is the best deal. What would that be? What do you think? In terms of building type, I would say industrial condo. Okay. In terms of location, I would say, I would say two spots. Honestly, I would say maybe Ventura County Mm -hmm. and also, uh, um, you know, towards San Bernardino County. Okay. Really? Okay. And what are the, the types of businesses that are most commonly in an industrial condo? Uh, either e-commerce mm-hmm. or if they have a wholesale, maybe they're in a floor and wholesale, they need space to store and they need a storefront up front. Um, they can be in electronics. Mm-hmm. They can be um, in many different aspects. How they, It all depends how they set it up. Got it. You know, what I prefer, you know, really like about the industrial condos is that you can have a small showroom in the front with like an office and in the back, it's a big warehouse. So you're doing everything in one place. Absolutely. In fact, I think they just... Even on Ventura Boulevard in Tarzana, um, they're converting a old Whole Foods, which is one of the largest ones, to a um, Amazon Fresh, and right. where they're it's largely a shipping center, right, in the back, and then the store ones in the front. So right. that makes sense. So let me ask you this. Um, so I know in the residential space, one of the best deals right now is buying. 15 to 20 million dollar 30 million dollar fixer mm-hmm. meaning like a higher end uh because above 10 million is considered um ultra luxury mm-hmm. and so to basically to buy an ultra luxury flip or fixer is a killer deal right now because there's not a lot of people who can absorb that cost and who can ha- uh, handle the carrying costs would you say in the commercial space there's a parallel to that like is there you know we see all these really large distressed buildings selling sometimes 50 percent off 80 percent you know Correct. huge huge discounts so would you say there is a advantage and a huge return in that space or do you think right now it's just such a, a such a, a power slide down that it's it would be a bigger risk than a bigger gain i think it's a bigger risk at this point so you don't think there's a value add opportunity in those at this some, point because it's limited, mm-hmm. very limited. There are some, I would say, but it's very limited. It's a big risk, and you have to be able to go take that risk and have the backup, and to survive the next couple of years if it doesn't really match what your idea is going to be. Okay. Got it. When do you see the volatility in the commercial market maybe tapering off a little bit? Do you see it? tapering off do you see it being volatile for the next couple of years i mean what, what do you if you could forecast it what would you say i think it's gonna be volatile for the next couple of years so with that volatility in mind how do you um how do you win how do you get how do you take advantage of that volatility to build more wealth quickly 
if, if you have the financial background to buy these buildings at these big discounts mm -hmm. and you have the idea to turn them around to, to, to something that's going to be attractable the space for them to come i think they're absolutely but those are going to be the you know the limited big players absolutely but that's yeah. that's the that's why it's it's a better value because right. you can buy for less because there's less competition right correct less competition and uh, even the big players, a lot of them won't take that risk. Right. Is it the you same know? big players taking the same risks right now? Do you see the same? In different in the different industries, depending if it's multifamily or industrial condo yeah. and stuff, yes. And one of the reasons, you know, I was just driving to Palm Springs a couple of weeks ago, and there are millions of square feet of industrial buildings being built right now there. Yes. On both sides of the freeway. Interesting. It's that. very unique. And why do you think that is? It's it's the Amazon. It's the Amazon similar companies. Not let's not say as big as Amazon. Some companies who want the e-commerce or just want distribution centers. So it's all distribution centers. You think that's cheaper land yeah. out there? Cheaper land, and it's just I think you know the echelon of people that live out there that could work out there can live out there at a much lower price. Yes. The homes are a lot less. Mm -hmm. You know they're going to be close to the job, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's kind of is a little bit more central. So to distribute, you know, throughout the West Coast, I would say right. Are there many single family homes being built to accommodate all the workers now for the distribution centers are you seeing in that area? I, I didn't see much uh, because I, again, I didn't exit the freeway to go yeah. drive through streets, but yeah. I would assume so. It's interesting. Yeah. Interesting yeah. dynamic. You know, but and you, you see the Toll Brothers at the KB Homes always mm -hmm. are always building out there. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you saw the Disney. Disney's doing a huge, huge Correct. build of thousands of units out Correct. there. Um, and that's going to be a massive project. I've been out yeah. there and I watched just. It just feels like for miles of pads, you just see pads for miles. It's like built. when you used to drive to Vegas, you know, yeah. when they were building all mm -hmm. the sticks, you know, it's the same feeling there, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And uh, I think they found a new water source out there, which is driving a lot of, right. um, a lot of the builds. Right. It helps. Yeah. Water will be an issue at some point. Depending. It always is. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, so, um, you know, something else Sarah and I were talking about is, uh, I'm fascinated by this mall situation. So, you know, it looked like malls were in a power slide down to crashing to be where they were going to be ghost towns everywhere. Right. And I mean, I've been all around the country and seen ghost town malls. Right. In fact, there was one in Augusta that uh, I think could be purchased for very, very inexpensive uh, that I was there a few years ago. And it was beautiful space, central, right. you know, um, but you see them all over. And now you're seeing a switch where the B and C malls are still getting sold off and, and changing hands. But the top A class retail, the companies are investing in more than ever and they're, they're thriving. Right. They're thriving. It's, it's shocking to me. This is, this blows me away. And I know it makes total sense. And, you know, the statistics support it and, you know, uh, shopping is great, but I'm just, shocked that these malls are thriving in, in a world of e-commerce and you know what so what do you think about that where do you think that's headed and what do you think is going to happen to those b and c retail spaces the the shopping malls i think that are going to survive are the ones that have that give you an experience and that have out that are outside mm -hmm. fresh air the enclosed ones are not going to make it as much as my gut feeling you know look what's happening a prime example of that is the century city mall which is thriving. They just, in the last one or two years, got a billion dollar CMBS loan when no one else was able to get it. You know, and you know, com you can compare it to the Beverly Center. Mm -hmm. Every When they did that remodel, it cost a lot of money. I really thought it's gonna survive, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. If you go in there now, it, it's rather dead. And a lot, a lot of vacancy, vacancies in there. And do you think that's mainly because of the stores that were there, they don't have the right anchor tenants? or that it's just inside? I think mainly because it's inside. Interesting. That's right. interesting. Yeah. You know, that um, it's thriving. Look at Rodeo. Again, if that's not considered a mall, but it's outside, you walk and all the stores are next to each other. You know, mm -hmm. in terms of the B and Cs, it, they might survive if they're the local shopping center and they don't have a big shopping center nearby, because you always have to go get a haircut, you have to go to the store. You know, there's right. certain stores you have to have a actual location for so they might survive otherwise a lot of them will be i think mixed-use buildings mm. and what do you think the the so do you think it's going to be more 
like I've seen some that are switching more to like medical uses. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I think in several cities uh, near us specifically, they've changed parking requirements mm -hmm. so that, um, you know, Sarah knows a lot more about this. She's much smarter than me, but, no, no, um, you know, she knows more of the details, but they're, they're, they're trying to attract those kinds of different sure. uh, businesses to the, to, to new areas that didn't previously even allow for like medical right. and, um, you know, we have some, some clients that own, uh, medical buildings in Arizona that are just thriving. They said right. they've, even through COVID, they've never had a, a hiccup. Right. So, you know, um, what do you, what, what are those mixed use businesses that you think are going to survive in those, in those new environments? It's going to be, it's going to depend on the demands of that, you know, that the homes around there, but I mean, you're going to, um, it can be medical. Obviously you're seeing a lot of hospitals being built. UCLA is opening one in every city almost. Cedar Sinai just did the huge one in Tarzana. Mm -hmm. with the, uh, it was a venture with uh, Providence, if I'm mistaken. Yep. You know. Did Cedars just buy West Hills, I heard as well? I'm not sure. I think that. UCLA bought it. Did, was it UCLA? I think so. Yeah. I, I believe so. I thought it was Cedars, but then I remember it was UCLA. It was UCLA. Yeah. yeah. So you're seeing, you're definitely seeing yep. a lot of that. You know? Yeah. I mean, obviously, medical is something that still largely needs to be in person. Right. We see the. Um, you know the the virtual doctor visits and stuff but right. a lot of that just has to be in person because right. it's your body right and right. right. they, they need you to feel your body and tell mm -hmm. you and see you in person to actually diagnose you so you're going to see more medical in these mixed use like smaller right. spaces and uh what other health, things would you expect um in health instead of beauty mm -hmm. you know uh cosmetics right let's see uh you're going to see a lot of veterinary hospitals Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. That makes sense. You're seeing those, uh, you know, come about a lot now. I see a lot of mobile bats, which is interesting. You do see those, but you still, you, they can't be a hospital, though, yeah, you know. That's true. That's that a local. Um, but, I mean, sushi spots, restaurants. Right. Lots of restaurants. Yeah, high yeah. margin. High margin high restaurants, margin, right? right? Like sushi, pizza. Correct. The margin on pizza blows me away. Right. It is staggering. Above There's the about two, three pizza. new brands of pizza that have come out, and they're expanding quite fast absolutely yeah you know. it's uh the margin on pizza is amazing but anyway right. it's, it's like similar to coffee almost yeah you know coffee shops that's a big one cafes you see them in every corner yeah mm -hmm. you know and you think it's going to be more places uh obviously a lot of the new malls have a lot of more restaurants and right. coffee shops and things and you think it's going to be more con based around places to congregate or is it just food, get in, get out, more of the, no, the fast No, it's, it's, it's the experience. If, you, if you're mm -hmm. trying to get in and out, you're going to use Postmates or you're going to use right. the Uber Eats. You're trying to get, go there and get an experience, you know, see people, feel people, talk to people. Beautiful you know, environment. Environment, see the sun. You know, otherwise you can stay in your house and everything can be delivered to you. Such an interesting perspective. Right. But I think people Makes are trying to that. realize, you know, that experience, you know, what Caruso has done with the mm -hmm. shopping centers, mm -hmm. you know, they're... I think the most expensive per squeak, square feet to lease, but because of the experience it gives you and the feeling it gives you, you know, people are willing to pay and people are always there. They're all busy. And you know, they're redoing in Calabasas now. He'll be redoing Correct. that. The, uh, I believe the movie theater is becoming about a hundred something uh, units. Yes. Yes. For, um, for lease. Yes. Yeah. And some restaurants and different things. And some restaurants. They're using the back space. Yeah. Yes. I think the interesting thing is what, um, I believe Kroenke bought, the Topanga Mall. He bought the, the village. And well, he the bought Tulane. the village, but the older mall. The um, correct, the Promenade Mall. Yeah, the Promenade that was basically vacant, and, and the mall and the land behind it, which had the two Anthem buildings. Correct, and so they're going to tear that down. They're building that back into a new high end space, along with you know the the a practice center for the Rams right. and uh, an amphitheater, which is going to be a place for people to seventy five hundred square seventy five hundred people. Right, 7,500 person uh, theater, theater space. Yeah, yeah with... it's got a one acre park next to it as well. Right. So, you know, it's interesting that they took a place that had been dilapidated and basically ready to be torn down in a space that has so much high end retail and office space and are building that into more high end office space and retail mm -hmm. and entertainment spaces. There's no office space in that anymore actually in the in the new structure correct oh it's two hotel buildings if i'm not mistaken oh okay yeah. i thought there was some 
office space. But anyway, the... yeah, he's taking. He, I think he took it out. Got they, it. they realize it's not needed. Okay. we have the uh, the Warner Center office buildings and they have a lot of vacancies. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> but I what he's doing is very unique. Yeah. It's not just taking something that already has so much high end retail right. and then reimagining it, rebuilding it into new high end retail entertainment space. Right. Um, it, it's an interesting model because it failed as a lower end mall that was older. And now is coming back as this, uh, you know, reimagined beauty. Right. Right. I mean, so do you see more of that happening to these older malls as well? Do you see that? No, I or do you think, think that's more of a fluke. That's in a lot of spaces, it can be a fluke. But mm -hmm. in that particular area, because of the Warner Center 2035 plan. Right. You know, and what's happening in amount of money, they're spending about $20 billion in that, you know, two, like that part, one particular section. Right. And, you, you know, when these players right now, they're playing out of the Cal Lutheran in Thousand Oaks. Mm -hmm. So all these players are now coming, being based every day, coming to Woodland Hills, Warner Center. Mm -hmm. Majority of them already live in Hidden Hills. You know, they've all moved to Hidden Hills or lo local in the valley in the higher end homes. Mm -hmm. So in, in the mall, you know, we got a lot of these higher end brand names, which we never existed. And I'm surprised a couple of them that are in there. But, you know, the amount of the due diligence that they spend before coming out, obviously, they, they see something. Yes. Correct. Topanga there. has had a huge influx of right. high-end retailers. Right. Yeah. Yes. And it's amazing to me. And they're and they're full every time I go. They in, are. They're they have full. lines outside waiting. Yes. Yeah. And you wonder where are all these people coming from? Right. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. from the, you know, nearby cities like yeah. from the Calabasas, from the Encino, yeah. Tarzana, like you know. Also Malibu. They don't have a lot of high-end uh, shopping in Malibu. You know, actually, Kroenke bought that shopping center in Malibu that has the Lululemon. I know. Yeah. He just bought that recently as well. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't have space there. Right. There's no space and that, that there's just Malibu in general is just a limited space Correct. environment. So right. there's only going to there's never going to be a giant mall there. Right. I mean, they're building some new commercial space now, but right. it's not going to serve the need. No, I know. a lot of those people do come to Topanga Mall. Right. And it's funny. Some of these um, people that work in the Neiman's there tell me that, you know, they have a lot of clients from Santa Barbara that come here. Yeah, it makes sense. That's interesting. Right. Because a lot of I guess the stores out there, they don't carry the brands or oh, uh, that right. Neiman's does in Topanga. They don't have the population that they exactly. do here. Mm -hmm. yes. Even though Montecito's right there and they Montecito's have a lot of local stores. Amazing. But... Well, there's a lot of people that travel to large malls like Topanga, like right. Mall of America, like all these giant malls Correct. across the country. It's a, there. there's whole tourism just around going to these malls, right. which is also a fascinating space to me. Yeah, so space, you know, on a Saturday, people take their family from, you know, a couple hours, go there, walk around, shop, eat, and yeah. they come home. That was the experience. Absolutely. You know. So changing gears from the malls a little bit. Um, so here in L.A., obviously, we have Inglewood, which is being completely redeveloped. They've right. built SoFi Stadium in a, uh, next to the Forum, which has right. been redone. And now they're building um, the third stadium there as the well. Intuit Dome. What's that? The Intuit Dome. The Intuit Dome. That's right. Yes. I was blanking on the name. Thank you. Save mm -hmm. me. So um, obviously, they're also spending billions of dollars on all the surrounding commercial uh, retail there. Right. So two part question. Number one is where do you see that going? And number two is how does someone who isn't a billionaire um, like the bombers and um, those guys who are obviously they have bought almost everything around there. How does someone who's not a billionaire go in and, and win in this environment? Number one, what's happening out there is, is amazing. It's really needed for LA. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think it's going to only get better. It's really they're cleaning up all those neighborhoods. Um, you know, uh, Kroenke himself is building a lot of the multifamily buildings around there, Correct. right by the SoFi Stadium. So I think it's really good for uh, LA needed it. And also, you know, uh, a little while ago, the tram from the LAX, the bond got approved that's going to come all the way to the SoFi Stadium. Right. So yeah. that's huge. That will be huge. You yes. know, LA never had such a thing. Yes. Yeah, we've been seeing a lot of uh, excitement around the homes, even along that 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 Correct. tram. Right. So in terms of that, I think it's great with this tram, with this underground, you know, um, that would be built all the way from downtown to Barrington. Mm -hmm. No, right. Uh, per parallel to uh, Wilshire is really much needed. It's right. going to take some time for the population to adjust to it, but they eventually will. You know, and we're also with all the different purple lines, the orange lines, the yellow lines, all the way from Canoga Park 
coming all the way to, you know, the, the airport, LA airport, you know, anything. So you don't need to go with the car. It's huge. Absolutely huge. Yeah. So all these things happening, which I believe should have happened years ago, but I would guess there were a lot of lobbies that didn't allow it and so forth. That's happening right now. And with Ingo, it's great. Much needed. Yeah. Uh, to, um, to address your second question in terms of how does somebody who's a, you know, average Joe try to get into that space and they don't have the billions, they can buy the, you know, the single family residence or the two unit or three unit in Eagle today mm -hmm. as an investment or even go live there, start with one, right? And, you know, see how it is and grow from there. Do you think the prices there still make sense to do that, Shanae? Depending on what's the price per square feet you're getting. And when you're living in it yourself, it obviously makes a lot more sense mm -hmm. versus an investment aspect. But again, or how long are you willing to sit on your money for it to grow? You know, it can all of a sudden in one year make up for the previous three years and didn't that didn't uh, you know increase as much. So it all depends what your investment strategy is. But as a whole, it will it will benefit. So still a good time to buy an Inglewood. Yes. Okay. Good to know. Got it. Yeah, because you know um, historically, a lot of the times owning a stadium has been kind of a I mean not a great idea, right? It's been kind of a clunker idea. Now, Kroenke, Bomber, all these guys are figuring out owning stadiums is actually like the lost leader. You own the stadium, make the money in the stadium, you have your team there, it's great. But now all the real estate around it is the real play, right? And you can make, you can build a, a city out of nothing just around your asset, right? Which makes your asset worth more. It makes the city worth more. You can make money off all those supporting businesses. So from a, um, the commercial aspect uh, perspective, how would somebody come in and win if, if uh, they either wanted to buy or rent a business in that area? What would be the formula for them to win there? They would have to do a uh, due diligence to see what, you know, what kind of, if they're, for example, they're the rest shot, you know, what does Conking not have in the stadium that would do well? That's a buy, buy there. And then let's say in a mixed use building or, in a, you know, in a nice retail space there. In terms of, they have to see what the team ants are for that, you know, for that vicinity. But I think anything restaurant related, anything I would say medical related, would do really good there. You know, because of the amount of population that's going to the stadium, coming out of the stadium, you know, different times for a concert, for a, for a game, for anything it might be. Absolutely. You know, yeah. it, I, um, obviously the big players are making the huge bucks because they're buying the bigger space. I mean, they're getting the tax breaks from the city, all this different stuff, but it, you know, Everybody to look at has to look at their budget and see what can you afford and what makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take a risk, make sure you take a risk that you can handle. Even if it gets negative or sour, you can handle and go through the tough times with it. And that's the advice you can get client. Correct. You know, you should have enough cash in the bank. Don't use all your cash and uh, oh, for next month you have no cash in the bank. God forbid something bad happens. It's a very, very smart perspective. You yeah. know, it will. In the past, you know, everybody was living off of their equity, right? You know, but those days are done. I mean, not to say that there's a, you know, a lot of equity in people's homes, but now people are rather realizing, okay, I don't want to use that. That's my retirement. So people are not really tapping into the equity as much. In I don't see it as much okay. before. Like not in like to 2005 to the 2005 era. Okay. Right now, I think they're tapping to a less. Okay. You know, it makes sense. All right. The, their assets are less like a bank and more like an asset. Correct. Or their purpose. Exactly. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. But overall, I think, you know, LA is seen a gentrification in many different districts and cities. That's going to really, in the next 10 years, be very appealing. The only help we would need from the local governments is with this, with the crime and homelessness. <laughs> homelessness is very bad. My daughter goes to UCLA and it's not great. Right. I went to UCLA back there was zero. It's not great. You know, now it's everywhere. You know, you see it in Calabasas, yeah. you see it in the, you know, higher echelon. And, and unfortunately, the police, it's come to a point where they, they, they're they restricted. Mm -hmm. More on the crime aspect. And do you think that that is affecting the um, commercial spaces as well? Or do you think it's more the residential or equal? I think m more on the residential space or somewhat equal. Mm -hmm. so, you know. We see we see a lot of buyers coming up from the west side wanting to move into the valley now. Right. Wanting, you know, a lower price point, not a lot of homelessness. Correct. Right safer safer lifestyle right you do see a lot of people moving from west la the whole west side to 
the valley, Calabasas, Westlake, North Ranch, Lake Sherwood. You do see a lot of that. Yes. But yeah, so it's before they say, oh, you're out there, you live in the sticks, we're not right. going out there. And now right. we want to be here. They want, you know, they want to be safe. Yes. Not to say that there isn't crimes out there, you know, but I, I would say in terms of statistics, it's a lot less. Yes. So regarding uh, commercial loans, what do you think the best commercial loan is for um, a small business owner? Would it be SDA loan? Would it be, um, you know, is there more conventional loans? Like what, what would you suggest if somebody says, hey, I want to come in, I want to own a building, I want uh, to build equity in the building, um, yeah, what, what do I do? Right. I mean, there's uh, there's two ways to go about it. It's either SBA or conventional. Mm -hmm. The good part about SBA is obviously it's ten percent down. Conventional, it's minimum twenty percent down. But you know there are costs associated with getting SBA loan, the SBA guarantee fees that the government takes. You know, there's uh, yearly reportings for the SBA loans versus convert conventional loan. Once you get it, there's no more yearly reportings. There's no SBA guarantee fees. But you have to put more money down. If you have the money today, I would definitely go with a conventional loan. So you think the conventional because it costs less or? Uh, well, no, it just costs less and the yearly reporting because every you know those yearly reporting financials cost money. Mm -hmm. Your CPA is going to charge it. Got it. Makes sense. You know, and but the only, but the difference is on the conventional side, that it's amortized over 20 years. On the SBA side, it's amortized over 25 years. So your payments on the conventional are going to be a bit higher. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. And but one thing to know is on both the SBA and the conventional, you don't need to go on a variable rate that's like first five years, seven years, ten years. It's fixed. SBAs have loads that are twenty-five year fixed, amortized over twenty or half years. So you never have to worry about refinancing. You know, a lot of things don't tell you that, but I preliminary put all of my clients on twenty-five over twenty-five. No, I don't want them to worry about refinancing. Maybe when it comes to that time, they don't have the tax return. So if things happen in their business, then now they're stuck, especially if that loan has a balloon payment and it's not variable. Conventional side as well, you can get a 20-year fix amortized over 20 years. You know, you don't have to get a five, seven, or 10-year fix amortized over 20. I always recommend going into the higher fix, the total period of the amortization fixed period loans. God knows tomorrow what happens to your business, to yourself, health, mm -hmm. you know, so... If you're in those, you never have to worry about refinancing. Here's the big question. Where do you see interest rates going when you see them dropping? That's the magic question. Um, you know, based on, you know, what's happened statistically during election years, they've always come down. Yep. Um, prime rate, beginning of the year, they said they're going to lower them. But due to the inflation reports, they did it. I think they just said one rate cut this year now. I think they just came out today. And if that. If that, Yeah. I don't see that happening personally. My gut feeling is no rate cuts this year. And, but again, one thing we have to remember is the prime rate is paid for short-term lending. So it's for your HELOG, short, you know, your credit card, your uh -huh. car loan. That has nothing to do with mortgages, but it, it only pertains to your second loans that are HELOCs that are variable rates. But mortgage are based on 10-year bond. Yes. And the 10-year bond has been a very unique situation. It's gone up. Is it going to come down? It's very hard to say. It's a million dollar yeah. question right now. It's a million dollar question. Everybody, everybody's saying, oh, yeah, it's going to come down. And a lot of the shopping for homes that are being done today mm -hmm. are in the hopes of rates are going to come down. I'm going to refinance because when the rates do come down, the prices will go up. Yeah, I know. And we're seeing a lot of buyers now becoming a lot more wary because they're not seeing that in the future. They're not seeing it. They're not feeling it. No, a lot of escrows are falling out. People right. are getting cold feet. It's a very unique situation where we are in a perfect stagnant inflation market. So I know in the residential side, um, a lot of savvy buyers are doing um, permanent rate buy downs. Do you see that in the commercial lending space as well? Not as much. Okay. Not as much. And that's just because they're mitigating their costs other ways. Correct. Got it. Got it. And you don't see the ways to bring down uh, typically on the commercial loans is, uh, in, uh, you know, Opening an account with that bank and saying depositing a million dollars or two million dollars that helps lower the rate, right? And that's the same with uh, with residential. With residential, well, with the residential, there's two ways you can do that in terms of the rate, but you could also buy it down, right? Yeah, but obviously, money under care, everybody wants more money under the exactly. Care, so if that makes sense, right? Right. Sometimes has a better balance sheet, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Out of the balance sheet, 
Exactly. All right. Absolutely. Wait, wow. Go ahead. We I mean, it's been, it's, I think we're almost at the end of the show. It's... Yeah, we're very close. And what we've learned from you so far is um, find the gaps, uh, service, 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 and service again, um, educate your, your clients, and then um, low over it, right? And I can see why your clients love you because you're taking the principles from your own life and you're helping guide them. And I can see the service that you're providing them goes above and beyond. Just here's the rate we give you. No, it's, it's, it's a, they're like family. It's you very know. admirable because you don't see that a lot. Right. Especially in the industries that we're in. Right. Yes. Right. Again, they're in it just to make their quick money. Yes. Leave. Sign on the dotted line. Let exactly. me get my commission and then you're out. You, I mean, you might not find me anymore. Yeah. And change the telephone number. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I've had my numbers for 25, 30 years. Yeah, and the MS speaks volumes. Right. Yes. You know, I'm here, you know, um, it's just, you know, uh, you know, going, doing good deeds, doing it, you know, making sure they're happy. They come back to you. It, they're, you're there to answer their questions even after the deal is done maybe six months later year later two years later if they have a question about the loan you got them you should be there for them so important absolutely and you don't see a lot of people doing that right. so i commend you for that thank you that's absolutely why they keep calling you for the next one too right well exactly right. Right. Yeah. so in the last couple minutes of this beautiful episode of the first mover yes. which by the way it, the whole point of the first mover is to help people be early movers in the space of real estate, try to make the first move to have the biggest gain. So in the last couple of minutes, do you have any hot tips for um, buyers, sellers, borrowers, whatever that, you know, like little secrets, like little, you know, in the last like couple minutes here, any, any secrets you could, you could give um, to the, to the viewers. The secret is, um, you know, number one, Keep your overhead down, you know, um, and if you don't own any property, first buy a residential property, own a user for yourself. Own a user, and is that a rental? or No, for yourself. Own a user. So it's like Rent. duplex or just single family. Yeah. You could, it could be a, a single family residence, could be a duplex, triplex, quadplex, you know, right. get the feel, live there. You know, there are responsibilities of owning real estate. It's not just living there, you know, you, you know, you, if you have a house, you have a garden, you have, you know, there's other bills that come up. You have to learn about it. So, you know, before investing and taking them, I think you should feel it, see how it is for yourself. You know, you should have a hands-on approach. And then some people like to buy the second home and move it to a bigger home for themselves and then buy an investment. Some people say, no, the home I bought, I'm going to stay, fix it up as I live in it. And then my second or third prop my second and property moving forward are all going to be investments. Got it. I mean, yeah. yeah. So it's it's really important to own one and feel yourself versus renting somewhere and buying an investment home. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. Mm. If, if people say California is so expensive, there's no opportunity available left. You you do not believe that. You speak there is opportunity at all said. times for everybody. Okay. It's just my nuts exactly. Right. You know. Yeah. So they did not have it. They have to get through it exactly. Absolutely. You know, has the cost of living. Rose risen, you know, in the last five years for everybody. Yes, you know that's what's, you know, um, that's the hurdle for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, before it was a lot less to live, mm -hmm. food, car, gas, everything. Right. So that's come and taken over, you know, a good portion of the amount of money now you can invest. Yes. So your investments are going to be smaller. If you've stayed in the same, you know, line of work and the same pay, let's say, and you've only got the three percent pay increases a year. Yes. But you do see a lot of people changing jobs to get the 20% increase yeah. nowadays. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we see a lot more people changing jobs yes. more commonly. Yes. Which is different from 10, 20 years. I have clients that have changed jobs four times in the last three years. Mm -hmm. Right. I think previously there used to be three um, career changes per life on average, and now it's like seven, if not. Right. Yeah. Fifth of it, I mean, it's on your average. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, my California is totally different in those averages. Absolutely. We're entrepreneurial in here. We're entrepreneurial. And I mean, you, your base pays are a lot higher. They have to be. Otherwise, you really can't survive. I mean, I have clients that literally drive three, four, five hours a day for their jobs. Yeah. So, you know, that's not easy. You know, they know. Well, those you do electric cars, I guess. Yeah. Well, yes and no. That it's not turning out what they want it to be, but let's see what happens. Yeah. Hopefully, they can make it better. 
that very often they don't think about the wear and tear and the time spent, the time value. In general, people tend to underestimate the time, the value of time. And then after, you know, one year, they get really tired and they're like, no, we have to sell this property and move. Right. I'm not driving anymore this much. Makes sense. Versus our, uh, our industries, the three of us, uh, we will work for free most of the time. <laughs> We only get paid if the job is done. That's right. Correct. Nothing should be trade. Mm-hmm. That's correct. I mean, that would be my advice is own property first and then, you know, look at investments. If you have the capability and you have the backup, definitely make investments. Real estate does pay off long-term. You can't look at it short-term.